Jesus came down from the Father to lift us to God. I'm in the book of Psalms tonight. Psalm 139. Now I'll begin reading with the first verse. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art intimately acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, Lord. It is high. I cannot attain to it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If, my, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. I did not train to be a preacher. I'm hesitant about telling people that sometimes, though. I'm afraid that after they hear me try to, they'll say we could tell very easily you didn't train for it. <laughs> but I trained to be a teacher. So you see, I don't have to preach as good as Tommy. Hallelujah. <laughs> and uh, in training to be a teacher, uh, I had to go through a certain amount of educational courses. I know Dennis is, is a music teacher. Any other teachers here? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, several of you. Well, you know what educational courses are like, don't you? You know, we used, to, we used to say, yeah, they are boring. And we used to say that those who can do and those who cannot teach, <laughs> and those who cannot teach, teach teachers how to teach. So. And you have to go through an education department to appreciate that, I promise you. But, uh, however, uh, I really thought that most of the stuff that we had to cover in educational courses was a waste of time. But I did learn a few things that did me some good, especially in methods and some things in educational psychology. Now, one of the things in educational psychology that has done me, I think, a lot of good in many ways is the concept that is called an advanced organizer. Now, basically what that means is that um, if you want to get some material across to your audience or your congregation or your class that is a complicated piece of material, that what you do is you try to come up with something that they know something about already. You reteach that, and while you are reteaching it, you highlight the likenesses between the old material that they might know and the new material that they don't know. And that gives your class a kind of a skeleton to hang stuff on and you move from the known to the unknown and it's a good effective learning method as I'm sure you can say. Well, let me give you an example. I wound up teaching at a little place called Chocowinity, North Carolina one time. Now that's an Indian name. And I know that you have a lot of names up here in Minnesota, but you'd, I guess you don't have a Chocowinity up here. But uh, anyway, well, I heard a story about a salesman that was going through Chocowinity one day, and he saw that word up on the signboard, and he didn't know how to say it. So he stopped at a little place to get something to drink, 
And uh, he said, Miss, would you, the girl that waited on him, he said, Miss, would you do something for me? She said, if I can, I will. He said, would you very clearly and distinctly pronounce the name of this place that I'm in? She said, yes, sir, I'd be glad to. The Dairy Queen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I was teaching at Chacoinity, and I went there to teach Spanish. But it wound up, you know how it is in the world of education, folks, that sometimes you teach stuff that you're not really equipped to teach. And I had to teach senior English of all things. Now, any English would have been hard enough, but they gave me the seniors before they were going off to college, you understand. And I had to prepare them with term papers. And I was not an English major, but there I was doing the best I could, all right? And I figured if my kids had to sweat, if I had to sweat, they would have to sweat. You know, I worked my socks off of them. But, well, anyhow, uh, I, I enjoyed teaching. I really did. I believed in working my students hard, but in being scrupulously fair and trying to let the kids know that I really cared about them. But anyway, that was back in the days when all of the high school seniors were reading Shakespeare's plays Macbeth. Now, if you know anything about uh, Chocowinity, North Carolina, and of course you don't, but Tommy does, you see, it's just a little crossroads community. It's a little rural place. And all of those kids came just about from farms or from that little tiny town. And I knew that those kids had about as much use for Shakespeare as a sow has with a riding saddle, don't you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, Jesus, how in the world? <laughs> I said, Jesus, how in the world am I going to get Macbeth across to my students? I want them to love the play like I do. And the Lord reminded me that when I first read Macbeth, I had thought that there were a lot of similarities to the story of King Saul in the Old Testament. You know, that started off being anointed and God raised him up to become king of Israel. But because he would not deal with the flaws in his own character, he wound up as a pitiful suicide. And I said, aha, there's my advance organizer. So I, I don't know if you could get away with this anymore, but I told my students to bring their Bibles in. Now, down in the South, and this was 1968, most of them had King James versions of the Bible, you see. We brought that in and we started studying the book of 1 Samuel, the rise and fall of King Saul. And by the time that the students got to Shakespeare's play Macbeth, they have a skeleton of the rising actions, the, how the play peaked at a certain point. But be, because of the character faults in Macbeth and in Lady Macbeth, it all fell apart and she committed suicide and he was, you know, and the whole thing. And, and besides that, by reading their King James versions of the Bible, they were prepared for Elizabethan English that Shakespeare wrote in, you know. I thought God was pretty smart to remember that, you know. And so we had a good time studying Macbeth, and I really believe that the kids got a lot out of it because God had given me an advance organizer to try to get this across to them. Now, I'm telling you this be simply to say that God says, where are you going to go and get away from me? Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? And David said, if I ascend up into heaven, Lord, you're there, and if I make my bed in, really, the word is Sheol, in the unseen place where dead people go when they die, God, you were already there ahead of me, and I see your graffiti all over the walls of my experience in life. God has been there, and it doesn't say Kilroy was here. It says Jesus came here before you and he's waiting for you. You see? And I really believe that God has filled history, he has filled our world, and he has filled our insides with the fact that he has made us for himself and he's been there ahead of us and he's just waiting for us to get there and discover his great love for him. Now, let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about, of how God stacks the cards 
of the universe to make it as easy as possible for you to come to him and as difficult as possible for you to say no. Go with me, if you will, back to ancient Greece. I grew up loving mythology, but I never found this story in the pages of my mythology. But it's a true story. In the fourth century, before, the, almost the fifth century before Christ, a plague gripped the city of Athens and people were dying like flies. And uh, they offered sacrifices to all of the gods whose temples dotted the Acropolis and were all over the city of Athens, but nothing ever got any better. Finally, in desperation, they sent someone to an oracle at Delphi. And the oracle said that if they would send someone to the island of Crete and bring back a man named Epimenides, he would tell them how the plague could be stopped. So a young man named Nicias made the journey to the island of Crete, and Epimenides agreed to return with him. When the people came down to the harbor to greet this man, they expected him immediately to tell them what to do. But he simply said, Tonight, I want some shepherds to shut up flocks of sheep. And when the sun comes up in the morning, I want some stonemasons with mortar ready for construction and we will meet on some grassy slope that you designate tomorrow morning. And they said, well, why not the slopes of Mars Hill? That was the second highest hill in Athens, you see. The Acropolis, where the temple of Athena was, the Parthenon, was the highest hill. And Mars Hill, the gathering place of the Senate of Athens, was the second highest place. And it had long grassy slopes that sloped down toward the harbor. And they said, that will be the perfect place. He said, fine, but tonight we will rest. I must rest from my journey. The people of Athens had no idea what he was about, but they did as he told them to do. And the next morning, just as the sun was putting its first rays through the columns, those gorgeous marble columns of the Parthenon, they assembled there, and Epimenides stepped out of the little house that they had given him to rest in during the night. And he called the people together and he said, men of Athens... We're going to proceed with this matter on the basis of three assumptions. First of all, Nicias has told me that you've offered sacrifices to all of the gods whose altars and temples you see here and that it is not any better. I must assume, therefore, that there is another god to whom you have not erected a temple who has power and control over this situation. And everybody nodded their heads. That made sense. And then he continued, my second assumption is that if he has the control over this, that he would do something about it if we knew how to petition him. But then somebody said, Epimenides, I agree with your logic, but how could we possibly petition or offer a sacrifice to a God whose name we do not even know? And Epimenides continued, that is my third assumption. For if he is powerful enough to be in control of it, and if he would be good enough to do something about it if we knew how to petition him, I'm going to assume also that he is kind enough to smile upon us in our ignorance if we will but admit our ignorance to him and ask his mercy in this case. That is why I have told the shepherds to shut up their sheep, and I'm going to ask this God whose name we do not know, to select his own sacrifice. Some of the people shook their heads and said, this man must be crazy. This will never work. Those sheep are ravenous. They haven't eaten anything all night long. But before they could object, Epimenides had lifted his hands and had already begun a prayer that went something like this, O oh God, whose name we do not know, look upon us in our plight. We do not know your name, nor how to sacrifice to you. So please be gracious and merciful to us in our pitiful ignorance. Since we do not know what to offer you, choose the sacrifices for yourself. Take white sheep, if white is what you want, black, if black pleases most. But look upon us in our pitiful ignorance and have mercy, we pray. He commanded the shepherds then to release those sheep that had been shut up all night long. And to be sure, as the sheep started out in that almost knee-deep, juicy green, knee-deep on a sheep, I mean, of course, 
You know, as they started trotting out there, some of them bleeding with the joy of being released in this juicy green grass covered with the early morning dew, they began nibbling. But over here, a fine, fat ewe crumpled to her knees and her chin fairly touched that green grass, but she didn't take a single bite. Over there, a choice ram did the same thing. And while most of the sheep were eating, all over that hillside, enough of those sheep fell to their knees or just lay, lay down in that grass without eating a single bite that nobody said these just must be sickly. No. It was too great an evidence for that. And somehow they knew that the prayer of Epimenides to this God whose name they did not know had been answered. Epimenides was now instructing the stonemasons. Mark the place where each sheep fell, he said, without eating and build a little altar there. The shepherds took the sheep away to keep them until the mortar on those little altars had set. By about four o'clock that afternoon, the altars were ready. Those sheep that had been selected through this marvelous and unusual method were brought and they were butchered and prepared for the sacrifice, but the stonemasons objected. Epimenides, they said. It is against our custom to sacrifice an animal on an altar to a god without any name on it. Shall we make up a name for this god that we do not know anything about? And Epimenides said, oh no. We have approached him on the basis of our pitiful, pitiful ignorance. Let us not now pretend that we know anything about him, lest we offend him with our presumption. If you must write something, engrave on the side of these altars, Agnosto Dei, to the unknown God. That's what they did. They offered the sheep there. And by morning, the plague was abating. People were being cured and healed for the first time since this horrible plague had begun. A shout of praise went up from the city of Athens and the people streamed out the gates and bringing oblations of water and wine and garlands of flowers to bedeck all of these little altars with the inscription to the unknown God. Epimenides was a hero. They rewarded him richly. He spent some time there and then went back to his home on Crete. The people continued to come out and worship at these little altars for a while. But as the months went by and changed into years, it was easier, of course, for them to go to those altars that were more familiar in the temples that were close at hand. And perhaps those altars on the slopes of Mars Hill might have completely fallen into ruin and been forgotten had not a couple of the men who had been young at the time that this happened knew that they needed to preserve this for the national history of Athens. And so they had it put in the budget of the city that one of those altars would be maintained as a memorial to the time when a god whose name they did not know, answered a remarkable prayer and spared their city. Five centuries went by. <laughs> and one day, a man who had been born a Jew and reborn a Christian was invited to address the intelligentsia and the elders of the city of Athens. And Saul of Tarsus, who was now having been chosen in two ways, as Tommy told us, being called Paul the Apostle, knew that he was facing one of the most intelligent and um, perhaps uh, agnostic groups in all of the world. And I have no doubt that this man of prayer had prayed all night. And still, as he walked toward Mars Hill on that morning, he said, O oh God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, give me the key to the heart and mind of Athens. And while he was walking on his way to Mars Hill, he passed a little rubble of stones Time had taken its toll, but there clearly etched on the side, visible for all to read in the Greek language, were the words, Agnosto Dei, 
to the unknown God. And the Holy Spirit whispered in his ear, Paul, here's your text for today, son. Go for it. <laughs> and so when they introduced Paul, he stood up. Now you must remember that the, that the uh, Mars Hill or the Areopagus is right beside the Acropolis where the Parthenon was in all those temples. And I can just see Paul standing up with that big Jewish nose hooking over his mustache and beard and those big brown eyes alight with the joy of the living Christ. And with a wave of his army said, Men of Athens, I perceive by these temples that you are extremely religious. But on my way here today, I passed by an altar that had the inscription to the unknown God. Him whom you have been worshiping in ignorance, I've come to tell you his name. His name is Jesus. He's the creator of the world, the Lord of glory, and the Savior of mankind. Hallelujah. And the people of Athens listened to Paul. And not everybody believed. But even some of those intellectuals who would have styled themselves as agnostics became believers that day. Because Paul preached a message on a text that God had put on a pile of stones five centuries before. God had prepared the consciousness and the history and the mentality of Athens because five centuries before he had placed an advance organizer on the very hillside where Paul preached his sermon. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Bob and Carol Nicholson, Richardson, I'm sorry, were working on an island in the South Pacific. Its name, I'm sorry, I cannot remember. But they ran into a problem as they tried to teach this um, very simple but pagan people the gospel of Jesus. Because every time they told the story of Judas betraying the Lord, the people misunderstood. You see, they had once been cannibals. And what they had done centuries before, and everybody knew about this, and they still did it in other ways. They still didn't still eat people, you understand. But in their forefathers, what they would do is they would pretend to be a friend to somebody. They'd bring in chickens and watermelons and potatoes and all of that stuff. And this fellow would stop guarding himself against a possible enemy. And when this fellow really had him buttered up and totally unsuspecting, he would kill him and take him home and eat him. And the people of that culture thought that the guy who let himself be taken in was a fool, you know, for not protect. And when they told, the missionaries told the story about Jesus and Judas, they thought Judas was the hero of the story and that Jesus was a goat for letting this man betray him in such a way. And so Bob and Carol began to pray, Lord Jesus, how will we ever break through this kind of cultural mentality and so that they can understand the truth of the gospel? And they kept praying. And one day in the spring, a couple of the tribes came together for a ritual that really caught the attention of Bob and Carol. And they asked the explanation because they saw that a child from this other village was coming to live here for a year and a child from their village was going to live over there. And they said, why do you do this? And the people said, you remember that we used to be cannibals. Of course we do. We know all about that. They said, you see, our forefathers had to come up with some way so that people on the island could trust one another. And they came up with the idea of exchanging a peace child each year. And as long as the peace child lived among the people of our village, nobody from that other village would betray or harm us in any way. And when Bob and Carol heard this, God spoke to them. And the next time they got the people together to try to share the gospel, they told them that Jesus was God's peace child who had come into the world to let man know that God was not out to hurt us, 
but that God had sent his peace child so that man would know we could trust a loving heavenly father who sent his own son to live among us. And the people understood then because the most wicked and vile thing you could do in all of that culture was to harm or betray the peace child. And when they heard that, nearly everybody in the village received the Lord Jesus as his Savior because God had found a way through their what we would call primitive customs to plant an advanced organizer in their mentality which when interpreted in the light of the gospel caused them to open their hearts to Jesus. If I were to ask you where is the most Christianized state in all of the world? Where in the world would you guess? Minnesota? <laughs> Forgive him, Lord. <laughs> I absolve you, Bob, you know. Ah. Well, would you be absolutely amazed if I told you that it was not even in the United States or Canada? It's in India. And this is how it came about many years ago. Oh, incidentally, the way I found out about this was last summer I was at the CFO up in Alberta. And there were two young men from India who were working and working their way through school at the little Bible college where the CFO was held up there. And they were from an area, a, a state in India, which is more than 90% Christian. The gospel went, well, anyway, I want to tell you about one of the peoples up in northwestern Burma called the Wa people. All of the pagan religions around them, the Buddhists and the Shintoists and the Hindus and the Islam, they had all tried to convert the Wa. But they would not respond. They said, no, this is not the true religion. There is one true God in heaven. And, and uh, they had a special name for him. But they said, he is the one true God. He created everything. And we must worship him alone. And they had a legend that once their forefathers had had a book which told them about the true God of heaven and how to worship him. But because of the wickedness of their ancestors, the book had been lost. But the legend went on to say that one day God in his mercy would send a man with a white face and he would have a copy of the book and would restore to them the knowledge of how to come to the one true God of heaven. One night, one of the old priests who helped the people to practice their folk religion in the worship of the one true God in the very simple ways that they had, had a dream. And the God of heaven, he said, had stood before him in this dream and said that they were to release a pony and have some of the young men to follow that pony. And the pony would lead them to the man with a book. So that's what they did. And I mean that pony just about exhausted those young fellas. He crossed creeks. He went up mountains and down through valleys. He crossed over into the northeastern section of India and he trotted into a little village where there were all of these huts around and trotted right up to the very center of this clearing where there was a hole in the ground with a pile of dirt beside it. And he stopped dead in his tracks. And when the young men from the village of Wa came and looked down into that hole. A man with a red beard, blue eyes, and a white face smiled up at them. He was a missionary. And they said, Do you have a book about the true God of heaven? He said, Indeed I do. They fell down on their knees and said, You must come back with us to our village. He and the people in that village taught them the gospel. They were born again and were baptized and said, you must come back. People from that village went back and took the Bible. And when the people saw the Bible and learned that it had the message of the true God of heaven, the entire people, tribe, came to Christ. Hallelujah. God again 
had found a way to implant something in their national consciousness that was a trigger for them to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, God is here and He is not silent. God has not floated off of some cloud in the universe having wound up His world and just left it to tick away without His intervention and concern. I want you to know that the God who is there is very much involved in His creatures. And God is doing everything that will not violate the will of man to implant everything possible around us and within us to trigger us to respond to that wonderful grace and to the fact that He has chosen us before the foundation of the world. And he's built it not only out there, brothers and sisters, but he's built it on the inside of us. But you know, there is something in us that does not want to conquer by surrendering, as Tommy told us, is the true way of doing it this morning. There is something within us that says, we will not have this man to rule over us. And the whole human problem is the fact that I don't want that God to be God. I want to be a God unto myself. I want to control things. And to prove it, I'm going to work as hard as I know how to recreate everybody around me in my image. Yeah. Do you remember... I hope the young people have read the King Arthur stories. I'm afraid that some of the great classics like Robin Hood and King Arthur and some of those things are just being lost. And you, Have you seen Excalibur? Anybody seen Excalibur? Yeah, a few of you. Well, I promise you, I, I saw it. And it didn't do the King Arthur story. But do you remember the scene in Excalibur? When uh, you remember that Lancelot fell in love with Guinevere, King Arthur's wife. And because he was afraid that his passion would override his principle and cause him to disgrace himself and the queen and all of the Camelot and the knights of the round table, he refused to sleep at the palace, but he slept in the woods instead. And one night while he was there, he was attacked by a man in armor exactly like his own. Lancelot struggled with all of his might. He was severely wounded in the side, but finally he got his attacker on his back on the ground. But rather than killing him, he lifted the visor and stared into his own face. And he realized that his greatest enemy was himself. And friends, I tell you, that when we resist the will of God, we are not just resisting a God out there someplace. We are resisting our own best interest. And we are making ourselves our own worst enemy. That's exactly what we're doing. And God wants us to know that. You know something? There is an instinct in us that knows that automatically if you'll just listen to it because God's building you know centuries ago Saint Augustine wrote these classic words thou hast made us for thyself O God and we can never rest until we rest in thee now somebody in our time said the same thing but a different words they said that when God made us he left a hole and it was a God-shaped hole and we can try to fill it with success or drugs or sex or possessions or money or fame or popularity or anything we want to, but nothing will make us feel complete and satisfied until we let Jesus in to occupy the place that His Father left for Him in our hearts. Only Jesus can make us feel complete. Back in 1975, when Ruth and I first took our girls to the Keystone CFO up in Pennsylvania. I was running a Christian bookstore. 
And I was just really becoming aware of some of the Jesus music that was being recorded and so marvelously. And I still love some of it. I, you know, I, I love groups like Lamb and their song about, uh, uh, what's that one I like so much? Grave Robber, you know that? Who knows uh, the group Lamb? A few of you? Well, what do y'all listen to? Good heavens. All right. Oh, oh my word. Well, anyway, there, there's so much of it that I think is just super stuff. That this big. But back then, one of the most popular groups, and I was just coming to know about them, was a group called Love Song. Anybody ever heard of Love Song? Yeah. Well, they had uh, cut their first album at that time. And I got a copy, a cassette of that because we just had a tape player put on our station wagon and we were going to ride to Pennsylvania and we were going to listen to some of these Christian tapes on the way up there and on the way back. And we got the tape love song and it had some really neat songs on there like one about the front seat and the back seat. I was sitting in the front seat trying really hard to be the driver thinking I was making real good time but always winding up the late arriver, you know? And, things like, and there was another one on there about a um, little country church on the edge of town. And one of my favorites that was entitled Two Hands with One Reach Out to Jesus and with the other Bring a Friend. But the song that blew me away every time I listened to it was a song that was called Welcome Back. And I guess the idea behind the song was that somebody had gotten away from God and the things that they had learned. Listen, and here's the words. Welcome back to the things that you once believed in. Welcome back to what you knew was right from the start. And this is the line that always tore me up. All you had to do was to be what you always wanted to be. You didn't hear me. All you had to do to come back to Jesus, really, was to be what you really, deep down inside, always wanted to be. And you know why that's true? Because God made you for Himself. And he's left his divine graffiti written on your soul. And there's something on the inside of you that knows instinctively that you belong to him. And I don't care. i the meanest man on the face of the earth tonight. If he would really, to get honest, would tell you that deep down inside of him, there is something that longs to be good and clean and undefiled one more time. And only Jesus can bring that about. God's programmed us that way. And to fight against it is to fight against your own highest interest. When Ruth and I first moved to Rocky Mount, this was back in 1978. Um, I was uh, director of a little ministry place called the Ancient of Days. We were open on Friday and Saturday nights. And we would have groups to come in and, and do concerts or we would have teaching or things like that. And that gave me some freedom to do some traveling and, and all. And it was a very workable situation. And the men in our full gospel chapter in Rocky Mount had a, a luncheon every Monday. And they asked me whenever I was in town on Monday to come and do, oh, maybe about a 10-minute teaching on a verse of Scripture or something like that, just something simple. And so I did. Now, there was a young fellow that lived in Wilson, 18 miles away, a young man in his early 20s named Steve that we had known from another community. Now, Steve had um, asked Jesus to come into his heart but Steve wasn't really prepared to let Jesus be Lord of everything yet because you see, Steve uh, was having some problems with smoking pot every once in a while. Sometimes it wasn't all that infrequent. And he had a good buddy over there in Rocky Mount named Skip. And on Saturday, 
Steve and Skip would go out water skiing and they would smoke pot. It's a wonder in the world they didn't choke themselves to death with a ski rope or something when they got high on pot it's a, or didn't drown or run the boat over them. But God was merciful as he always is. Hallelujah. Praise his wonderful name for his great mercy to us. But anyway, Steve would smoke his pot on Saturday night, but praise God, he'd go to church on Sunday morning. Now, if you're going to do some mess like that, at least stay under the ministry of God's Word. Maybe it'll break through and do what it's supposed to do one of these times, you know. I used to have a pastor that told people that if they had to work on, on Saturday night, he said, you come on to church and sleep in church if you need to. You might wake up and hear something that'll do you some good, you know. So... <laughs> Anyway, but Steve started coming to these Monday luncheons. And I would see Steve every night. And then Steve started bringing Skip. All right? Well, one Monday, after I had taught and we'd had our meal and we'd had our prayer time and all of the men had left, but Steve and Skip and I had gotten into a conversation. Now, I must tell you that Skip is a very intellectual young man. He had done a lot of reading, had a lot of interest in mysticism and oriental religions and things like that. And uh, I wouldn't fancy myself as, 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 you know, an intellectual match for him. He's an incredibly bright young man, good businessman and, and, and all of that. So, but the waitress came to clear off the table and asked us if we would move over to a table in the corner of this little holiday inn where we were meeting. And so we did. And we were sitting there drinking coffee and the discussion had turned to that age-old question, you know, if God is really good and fair, he ought to have a whole bunch of doors. He ought to have a back door and a side door and a few windows. And, you know, you know if God is really fair, God could not refuse to let somebody who was sincere in their religion, whatever it might be, into heaven. Because that wouldn't be fair. And I knew I had a problem. Because, you know, you cannot use pat arguments. I mean, with really intellectual people. I think that's why Jesus lets me run into some people like that with some hard questions. Because Jesus has to find a way to stimulate me, you know? And I knew, have you learned yet? that in situations like that, if God doesn't have something to say, you haven't either. Well, I took a sip of my coffee to give me time to pray. <laughs> and I said, Jesus, what can I say to this young man? And I heard these words forming in my heart. And I'm sure that this exact thing had never come to me before. I set my cup down and I looked across that little square table over in there in the corner of the Holiday Inn. And I said, Skip, what you say sounds so right. But you know something? If, just, if sincerity in just any religion is enough to get men into the presence of God, then the cross of Jesus Christ was the saddest mistake and the greatest waste in the history of the universe. And that was it. And I took another sip of coffee. But I looked across that table, and brothers and sisters, I promise you that Skip Watson would have not been any more shaken if I had hit him with something. He was stunned. And all of a sudden, that handsome, intellectual, confident young face twisted up like a little baby's. And Skip choked out the words, I don't believe the cross was a mistake. And he burst into tears. And I reached across the table and took his hand. And I said, Skip, you want the cross as your own tonight, today, don't you? He said, yes, I do. And I led him in the sinner's prayer while God turned that little table in the corner of the Holiday Inn 
into a maternity ward. And Skip was born into the family of God. He is now the president of our full gospel chapter in Rocky Mount. A long while after this, I got to thinking about that remarkable incident that day at the Holiday Inn, and I said, Jesus, why did those words that seemed so simple have such a powerful effect on Skip? And what Jesus told me was, Wayne, don't you know that the reason Skip got involved in all of that stuff was because he was looking for the truth? And I knew that his heart would respond to the truth. So I gave you the words that would touch that place that I had already prepared in him by his hungering after the truth. And it hit its target. Oh, he could have resisted, but it would have been incredibly hard. You see? Friend of mine, let me tell you something. God made you for himself. And you can go to Minnesota or Canada. You can go to Korea. You can go anywhere you want to. You can go into the slums of the Twin Cities. Or you can go to Skid Row in New York and you can try to hide from everybody that loves you or knows anything about you. But you'll never hide from him. And I'll tell you this, that everywhere you turn, you will see divine graffiti saying, I love you. Won't you come to me? Don't fight against your own best interest. All you had to do was to be what you always really wanted to be. Let me set you free so you can be exactly that. Let's pray together. I'm going to ask that our heads be bowed and that we be praying much for one another. I, I just feel tonight, really, in, in my heart that there's some people here who need to confess to God. I've been trying to run from you. I've really been fighting against what I know deep down inside me is right for me to do. And Lord, tonight, I just want to take my stand with Jesus. I don't want to run anymore. I don't want to fight anymore. I want to let Jesus occupy his rightful place in my life. I know God made me for himself. And I don't want to fight against it anymore. I want my life fulfilled and complete. I want to let Jesus have his way with me. And I'm going to ask you to do something very daring and yet so wonderful and simple. I'm going to ask you that if God is saying that to you tonight and say, Wayne's talking to you, I'm going to ask you to just stand up right where you are and say, that's me. I want to let Jesus be my Lord. I want him to complete my life. I don't want to run anymore. And so I'm standing to my feet. And letting the world know, I want to belong to Jesus. Stand up right now. Stand right now where you are. Hallelujah. And there's some others that need to stand right now. Hallelujah. Yes. And there's others. I'm sure that you understand that you probably shouldn't stand just because somebody else did. But friend of mine, if, you, if God's talking to your heart, you ought to stand. Please don't sit there 
and let this chance go by to declare that you belong to Jesus and that that's really what you want to do with your life is to obey and serve Him. There are others who need to stand right now. Come on. Who is it? Is it you?